everybody and welcome to this, um, the fifth in the series of Critical Conversations. Um, this is the last event that we'll be holding this semester, so we're really happy that you could join us. Um, for those of you who haven't been before, this is a series of events that is aimed at kickstarting a dialogue around the university museums, around their history um, and how the university community can engage with current activities and future plans um, that we have. So just a bit of housekeeping to start. If you want to turn on live captions, you can do so by clicking on the three dots on the menu on your screen. And please do also use the Q&A function if you wish to ask a question. There's going to be plenty of time for discussion at the end. Um, so please do put in your questions whenever you like and we'll read them all. So I'll begin by introducing myself and then our three panellists today. I'm Emma Bond, I'm an academic in the School of Modern Languages and I'll be moderating tonight's discussion. I'm involved in this series because I'm organising, helping to organise an exhibition which will take place at the Wardlaw Museum in 2022 called Recollecting Empire. And the exhibition is also a chance for the museums to engage with processes encouraging um, diversity and decolonisation. And that's why we're linking these events into the exhibition because we really want to just hold conversations that touch on the kinds of issues that the exhibition will also raise and try and involve lots of different voices in those conversations. So this evening we are very lucky to have three guests with us. Uh, we have Dr Rowan Gard, who is a social scientist working at the university. Her research has taken her throughout Oceania, including projects in New Zealand, Fiji, Hawaii and Rapa Nui East, East Island. Uh, she also has a lot of experience working with uh, material culture in museums and community engagement. She's held uh, management positions at both the Bishop Museum, which is the Hawaii State Museum of Cultural and Natural History, um, and at the Hearst Museum of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. And then we have Sophie Lienehan. So Sophie graduated from the University of St Andrews with a, an MLit in Museum and Gallery Studies. And since graduating, she's undertaken a one year traineeship at the University Museums. And during that time, she's helped to establish a provenance research project that we're going to touch upon in tonight's discussion. And Sophie's now working on the online storytelling with museums collections project funded by the Museums Association, which is digitizing the university's collections and piloting an exhibit tool. And last but not least, uh, we have Ananya Jane, who is a third year undergraduate student studying art history and English. Ananya is also involved in the BAME network and as such represents the interests of the BAME student community at St Andrews. Ananya has been very closely involved in the planning of all of these critical conversations and has been an invaluable interlocutor for us all throughout. So I'll briefly talk you through the structure of the event. We'll start with five minute presentations from each of our panelists in which they'll share their own interests in the questions that are underpinning tonight's conversation. Tonight we'll be focusing on working with source communities um, to reinterpret objects in the museum collections and the practicalities and opportunities involved in doing so. And as always, we'll be linking our conversation back to one particular object in the museum collections. And there is a link to the object in the Q&A tab already. So you'll see this is a 19th century mouth ornament. And Sophie's going to tell us a little bit more about that. So I'll pass on to Sophie now. Hello and uh, thank you for having us. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, so as Emma said, I'm just going to quickly take you through uh, the mouth ornament, which you can find in the chat section uh, if you wanted to have a look at it as I talk. Um, so museums are running a provenance research project uh, where a group of volunteers are currently transcribing our early museum records. And we are using this to try to attempt to match up what we currently have in the collection with our early records. Um, these records have included uh, meeting minutes from the Literary and Philosophical Society of the University of St Andrews, uh, which was established in the 1830s and is essentially a precursor to our current museum. It also includes a 1904 catalogue of the museum contents uh, and crucially for this object, a uh, inventory of the ethnographic collection that we have uh, by a man called Richard Farzen. Um, this recent catalogue uh, listed our ethnographic collection and organised 
organized it by region. Um, and in it, I'll just read the following entry for this mouth ornament that we had. Uh, so it's 1977.120 mouth ornament, composite of tusks, beads, dog's teeth and resin, restored in 1987. In a personal communication, March 1983, Marilyn Strathern tentatively suggests that it comes from the area around the mouth of the Sepik River in northeast New Guinea. It is certainly a war charm held in the mouth during fighting. The article appears in an early inventory, 1904, item 182, page 854, uh, ornament made of teeth and beads, but there is no information about its donor. Uh, now, our database record for this object essentially had what was in Farden's catalogue from the 1980s with no further information, uh, and that was what was going into the Wardlaw Museum. Now, during a session of matching our uh, transcriptions to our objects in our collection, I came across an entry of regal ornament, Captain Brown, Duke of York Islands from the Littonville meeting minutes. Now, having consulted Farden's catalogue uh, with the note about the 1904 entry of ornament of teeth and beads, it wasn't a humongous leap to say that this object could have gone from regal ornament to ornament with teeth and beads to the mouth ornament that we had today, and we deemed it worth investigating. Um, and very luckily for us, uh, our director Katie Eagleton had actually been in contact with a man called Dr Tony Crook from Social Anthropology, uh, who in turn suggested that we speak to a PhD student called Gregory Bablis. Uh, now, Greg has worked as a curator for modern history at the Papua New Guinea Museum of uh, National Museum of and Art Gallery. Sorry, a bit of a mouthful. Um, and Tony believed that he would offer us a really good insight. Uh, so we had Greg come and visit us at the collection centre just to view the ornament, have some initial thoughts and take some photographs to forward on to some um, colleagues he had in Papua New Guinea. Um, he didn't say definitely what its use was, but he did confirm for us that it was made of boar's teeth, uh, uh, boar's tusks, dog's teeth uh, and dawara shells, uh, which is essentially shell money. Um, and he also confirmed for us that it was likely not from the mainland of Papua New Guinea, as our entry would suggest. Uh, so as I said, he took some photos, forwarded it on, and that is when we heard from a man called Denny from East New Britain. Uh, he sent us a very comprehensive response, which helped us gain, uh, gain a more likely origin for this object. Um, so we went from having it in mainland New Guinea to a possible Duke of York Island. Denny believed that this was actually more likely made in the southwest coast of New Ireland. And it was possible that it was traded between the island nations uh, to end up on the Duke of York Island, uh, which was at the time a popular trading post. And just as a quick aside, uh, for the Captain Brown, who originally gave us this object, we actually weren't able to find any information on him um, in our university records. All we had was that he was called Captain Brown. Um, no first name, no date of birth, nothing. It wasn't until a chance encounter at St Andrew's Cathedral with Katie, where she was walking through the cathedral grounds and saw a gravestone with a ship on it, uh, just stopped to have a look and lo and behold on there was Captain Alexander Brown of the HMS Anna Robertson. Um, it was the grave that he erected in memory of some of his family um, and from this we just went and looked up the shipping records for the HMS Anna Robertson. Lo and behold it was Captain Alexander Brown um, who had been in the region around Papua New Guinea in the years immediately prior to this mouth ornament appearing into our records. Now again, this isn't a definite confirmation, but we've taken it as a pretty likely match for both Captain Brown to the Anna Robertson, Captain Brown to the mouth ornament, mouth ornament to our records. Now Denny's information, uh, as well as combined with the rest of the provenance research, has directly influenced how the mouth ornament is being displayed. Um, before this project, the label continued to only list the information available from Farden's catalogue, uh, but now it is far more comprehensive and it highlights uh, museum's continued effort into trying to research our collections. It's by no means to say that our research is perfect. There is still a long, long way to go for a lot of our collections. Definitely need more research, but it is a promising sign that we are headed in the right direction here at museums. Um, and just as a quick tidbit, which I just really enjoy from my email correspondence with Greg, he sent me an email that said, my contact said she showed the pictures of the objects I sent her to a chief who has asked by the chief to pay one at Param, which is an arm length shell money for the information that he would give her. Just for context, one Param equals about 24 pounds. 
Great, thank you so much, Sophie, for taking us through what sounds like quite kind of painstaking and still kind of fragmentary sort of process as well. It sounds a lot like detective work when you're trying to piece together all these kind of clues and, and make a story that makes sense. Um, Rowan, love to hear from you now. Good evening, thanks Emma, thank you Sophie. I love that example uh, because I think it reflects what a dynamic world the past was and we're often guilty of, of looking into the past and seeing it as something that was quite stagnant or static. Um, in my own experiences, I've had the good fortune of living and working in Oceania and a number of communities, as I mentioned, uh, in Fiji and Vanuatu and uh, New Zealand, as well as Hawaii. And from that experience, I've felt really fortunate to work with Oceania ethnographic materials, especially in my time there. And it's very, it's very dynamic. There was extensive trade routes, heavily, heavily traded items throughout uh, prehistory, especially obsidian, just sort of as a side note, uh, which was a really useful uh, use for weapons and tools, obsidian or um, glass, the volcanic glass. Um, so I love this example because it reminds us that people just like now, we're mixing it up, trading things, and engaging, interacting, exchanging ideas and culture. And um, I think that's important for us to keep in mind, especially now, well, I guess it reminds me of a William Faulkner quote that says, the past is never dead. The past is never even in the past. And I think we're guilty of that in a number of ways in museums, as much as I think we succeed in a lot of things of caring for these beautiful objects and keeping them in the realm of the you know public so that people can appreciate them, learn from them, grow and, and research what's happening there. I think we are guilty of still creating sort of stereotypical interpretations around them. And I think this object is a great reminder of, of how things grow and change in our own understandings of that. So I guess I would just um, say one more thing. In my own work, I found that being at times uh, clear about the current political and environmental relationships that objects exist in, as part of that idea that things are sort of just free floating. I think we tend to remove them from at times their histories as well as their present. So we want to maybe look at the beauty of the object, which is understandable, but we don't want to talk about the realities that those communities might be facing right now. For example, I work with folks in Oceania in several communities who are on the front lines of climate change, and that's very real for them. That has serious political implications. Um, really, the, their whole way of life is under threat. In some of those communities. So I don't think it's so easy for us to pull things apart and I hope that as we think of the future in our own museum collections that we can keep things present and acknowledging the rich past of the her heritage. So I guess I'll leave it there for now and um, come back and have a few more stories maybe. Perfect, thank you Rowan. Um, lots of things for us to pick on, pick up on later. Uh, we'll move on to Ananya now, just to remind you all though, um, if, if, if things are also buzzing in your minds and you want to ask your questions already in the Q&A, then just go ahead and, and type them now. We'll be, we'll be watching for them all. Ananya. Thank you so much both Sophie and Rowan. I think that was, there was so much to learn for me. Um, I, I'm coming from a completely different context. I'm still pursuing my undergraduate studies just in my third year. So really trying to learn and understand more about these different things, which I know nothing about. And I think, um, you know, despite my own interest in looking into South Asian identity and representation of specifically like South Asia as a quote unquote marginal community or subaltern space and how it's represented in the West specifically, I think um, my own personal lack of awareness about, let's say, this object and this particular re region made me think a lot about, um, you know, just the nature of the way we study things. So even while there there's designations of some areas and things as marginal and disadvantaged groups, there still tends to be a focus on some of them more than the others. So a kind of an advantage within those, right? So there is more of a focus of uh, understanding of some groups as disadvantaged, but then a less obvious representation of like other groups. So I think that's what I was thinking about a lot. And while we are specifically in the current climate with the different conversations that have been accelerated, we are thinking about different perspectives, non-European points of views, we're thinking about different regions, but um, there's still a lot more work to be done 
there's so much more we need to learn, so much more we need to think about, and there's so much more to explore. So while obviously I don't think it's OK to generalize and say, OK, there's been enough work on South Asia. Don't focus on that anymore, because that also is a, a generalization, I guess, like even a, a region like South Asia or the African continent where there has been some work done. Those are also massive regions and there's so much more to explore within them about communities. I think certain other regions are often overlooked or not considered typically um, let's say if you look at the lens of colonialism, not typically considered to be colonies or like different uh, societies and groups and indigenous groups are often still marginalized. And um, even within subaltern histories and conversations about the subaltern, I think we have a long way to go. And I think this speaks back to the very dynamic nature of research, like how Sophie was talking about the way our interpretations of this very object changed. I think um, that's always going to happen. There's always going to be this need for reevaluation, and that's just something we need to accept. So no matter how correct or OK an interpretation seems, we always need to question that because the past is something that is dynamic almost because, you know, we're always learning more about it. And I think through this conversation and by learning so much about this object and these communities, it's made me think about how there's always more work to be done, and that's what I am quite interested in and quite interested in understanding about this object. Thank you so much, Ananya. Thank you to all of you. Um, I'll just pick up briefly on something that Ananya just was talking about, this kind of hierarchies of difference in a sense in, in, in museum interpretation and representation and I'd like to put that back to you if you don't mind Rowan and um, I think you'd mentioned when we had other conversations about this that there was a sense that with ethnographic collections in particular there's an appreciation of these objects that rests on the fact that they're primitive and there's this, this certain kind of mindset of yes they might be beautiful but we, we can put them somewhere else that doesn't really appreciate their aesthetics or their value or their context because they're sort of primitive in a way um, do you want to speak a little bit more to that and how that might differ from other other items in collections from different communities that you've worked with yeah no thank you uh, i was thinking i would like to just join in off when Ananya was talking there, because that is something I've seen with my work. And, and it's not even something I'd say that's limited to America or to Europe. I'm, I'm remembering one time when I was in Taiwan for a conference and I got into a taxi cab and asked the driver to take me to their National Ethnographic Museum. Um, and it's focused obviously on, a, on indigenous communities and indigenous art. And he wanted to take me to another national, the well-known national museum. And so he was very much like, no, no. I'm, and he was trying to be helpful. He said, you don't want to go there. It's not good. It's not a good museum. <laughs> so I think it's not something that's just in the West, but we're definitely guilty of that. As someone who is an Oceanist, who spent my time, my, you know, my career and my life dedicated to that material, how, how beautiful it is and how much I love it and what artistry goes into it. I think especially Oceanian and African collections in my experience, have minimized attention. It's often seen as exotic. Um, it's often seen as primitive, erotic, and very much seen as sort of this other. And unfortunately, this this sort of gets self-reinforced, I think, in museums. We do create some beautiful exhibitions, but there's no way the attention, I would say, or even the staff or the funding that goes into caring to those for those collections in general, as compared to say Renaissance painting or the classics, which are also exciting collections and fascinating, but so much is directed toward that, that when these exhibits do come out dedicated to uh, various, say, Australian art or things like that, that it is looked at, but it's almost like it is always through this exotic lens and it's never put on par with, say, you know, Italian masterpieces or th something along those lines. And so it's this sort of bizarre reinforcing cycle where we keep seeing it like this. And and I find it very concerning. I've I've written professionally about it, and I've called it out professionally, um, and and I think we have a long a long way to go. So I'll leave my comment there for now. But I think this is one of the most important things for us as a as a community to deal with in the coming decades. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you for that um, consideration. It's so interesting to hear how that happens differently in different contexts as well. 
Um, Sophie, I'm, I want to ask you a question. Actually, there's um, yeah, I was I was sort of talking about how the process that you described was quite sort of fragmentary and and, and painstaking, but there was also I guess an element of serendipity there, right? Um, we were quite lucky that Gregory was was here and he could facilitate that conversation with communities back in Papua New, New Guinea. Um, so I was wondering what 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 do we do when there isn't that kind of easy link and how how else do you think that museums can reach out to source communities what are the best ways of of kind of embarking on that dialogue yes it, it is by luck and by chance a lot of this uh, that we've managed to find so much information um the provenance researchers who are working on this that they just have to have so much dedication um and i think we're very fortunate in the context we're in i think um you know, working for a university museum, we have a very diverse student body, we have a very diverse staff body, which means we do have the people who have connections to these communities. Um, and kind of similarly picking up on this idea of that you've both mentioned, um, and Anya and Rowan, about the exotic, the other. It is something that I think is perpetuated in museums, and I don't think it's something that we can accept anymore just because we are such a connected world. Um, you know, we can travel you can be across the other side of the world in 12 hours with an aeroplane. You can message someone in five minutes with an email. Um, and I think that's just what you have to do. You just have to ask people you know who might know someone, who might know someone else, who might know someone who worked at a museum. I think that's the nice thing about these objects is it connects people across countries. You know, I never would have thought that I'd be speaking to someone from the National Museum of Papua New Guinea when I started this job. Um, so I think it's just a matter of perseverance and just looking. I, I don't know what else to say other one. You just have to look and we can't say that you can't look because we have the Internet. You can just Google, you know, if you have an object you think is from Papua New Guinea, you can just Google Papua New Guinea Museum and you can bring up their catalogue and you can see their objects and you can try and compare and contrast, which is something that we actually did do with this object is try and find uh, contemporary and comparable objects in their museum. Unfortunately, in this case, they didn't have anything at the Papua New Guinea Museum, um, but they did have the people who had the expertise, which was very fortunate. Um, but I, I think that's another good question to highlight some of the issues of this is the fact that we don't always have good records, uh, and that's just an unfortunate truth in museums. Um, the time when a lot of these objects were collected, there wasn't standards in place for documentation. Um, and thinking of this object in particular, if we hadn't known Dr. C Tony Cook and if he hadn't known Greg, we wouldn't have had this information about this object. We still probably would be perpetuating what we had in Farden's catalogue. Um, and it is difficult and I'm not sure there's a good answer of how to get around it because there's just sometimes the simple answer is the record's not there and you can't do anything about it because it's now history. Um, yeah, it's difficult. It's really difficult. Uh, you have to have a lot of perseverance to get through some of these objects and sometimes you have to cut your losses. Um, luckily for this object, we didn't have to. But. Great, thank you. Yeah, there must be an element of, of sort of knowing when when you've got to move on to the next object and try and, and try and divert your energies, I'm sure. Um, just a, another question for Rowan, actually. Um, because it's striking me that there's there's an element of risk, right, uh, in going back to source communities, um, in that that kind of a that that sort of reaching out can feel maybe a little bit extractive. Um, where mm. Western museums that hold items from elsewhere that were taken in often unequal dynamics of power, and then we go back to them and we ask them for more information so that we can improve our displays and I'm wondering if that sometimes reinforces that dynamic of you know give us give us more give us more so how can we make sure that that process is is sort of beneficial for both parties mm -hmm. no it's an interesting question for sure and I mean there are legal obligations and of course moral obligations as well I know for example that I have a colleague in Aberdeen who had some Native American grave goods, so sacred objects and human remains. And in the US in the early 1990s and 1992, we had something called NAGPRA that was affected through Congress. That's the Native American Graves Repatriation Act. So museums across the US returned to origin or source communities 
to the best of their abilities, sacred objects and human remains. And my colleague in Aberdeen um, was under no obligation to do that, obviously being here in the UK, but he, they did have some sacred objects and he felt and he consulted with his board and his colleagues that it was the right thing to do that. So he was able to repatriate uh, I think it was one or two objects that were of great value to the tribe. And through there, he was able to create some really excellent, um, you know, networking and, and dialogue essentially so that he were able to have more information related to their collections and the tribe was able to receive um, something returned to them. So it's not, it's never, I'd say, you know, one way back and forth. It's often really complicated. I think sort of a flip example that I was in Hawaii at the Bishop Museum when we borrowed on loan from the British Museum uh, a coup, a god figurine, the god of war, his name is Ku. Uh, so we reunited the three existing gods of war for the in Bishop Museum, which is a big deal. They would not have ever been together, but they would not have been in the Hawaiian Islands for several hundred years because of, you know, histories and politics and things. So the British Museum had one, um, Penn State, I think, had the other. So I was there at Bishop when we reunited them and many people made pilgrimages to see the coup figures. And it was a really special exhibition to say the least. And everyone in the museum, we were whispering. And I suspect our colleagues at the British Museum wondered, would we return it? That was like the whisper was like, are we going to fight it and say we won't give it back? We've got it. We're not <laughs> sending it back. And we did. We, um, I believe it had a special courier because, you know, art has to be handled in certain ways. And this was a very high valuable object. We did return it, but there was interesting dialogues and communication that went on. And, and I think if you're, if you're ready and willing to engage, you know, in an open dialogue and acknowledge the really ugly parts of our past and our history and say like, you know, the colleagues at the British Museum and elsewhere wanted to create something special. They wanted to do the right thing and to have this be something for the Hawaiian people. And it, it was, it was wonderful, but we all exist in the world we exist in, right? And um, so it's, it's complicated. I do know museums who repatriate, others don't, but sometimes they're able to engage in long-term loans as well. So to loan an object for you know decades even to another museum in the uh, source community. So there's no easy answers there, but um, I think it is it's really important to start and just talk and try and figure out a way together forward. Ananya, uh, do you want to ask a question? I think <laughs> I was wondering and we were talking we're talking a lot about source communities. And I was just wondering uh, what kind of challenges come with identify who, identifying who the source community is, because I guess with objects and where they come from, the source community could be a different country. Uh, it could be a very specific indigenous community. So I guess like all other things, there is a very specific power dynamic there as well, right? So do you ask the government of the country? Do you ask the museum or do you ask um, specific community. So who has the voice? Who is the connecting voice to specifically like let's say we have an object here which we found. Who are we speaking mm -hmm. to provide that authoritative information? And I feel like that's something I would be quite interested in knowing because while we are using the word source community that also has lots of nuances to it. Sophie, would you like to answer that one? Well, I think one of the kind of really famous examples that really comes to mind when you mention that is the Benin bronzes in the British Museum. Obviously, these are bronzes that were taken in le less than uh, good circumstances. Um, but now, you know, Benin doesn't exist. Um, so who do you speak to? It is a really, really difficult question. And so unfortunately, I'm not sure I can. I'm not sure I can answer that. And it's also a question of I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that. Um, you know, I think you ask, how do we find the source community? It does, again starts with provenance research. You need those records to kind of trace it back to where it was found, taken, acquired, whatever. Um, and I think that's always the best first step is just finding where it came from. Um, but then when you get there, yeah, who who is the correct person to talk to? You know, you can go to a culture that might have ties, for example, to the past. And I believe uh, Rowan's mentioned NAGPRA. That's often what they do. They go to the people now who have the closest connection to these past uh, 
Native American tribes. Um, but there's also, you know, academics who can be re uh, experts in the area. Um, it is such a difficult question to answer. Um, and I'm not sure I can. I'm not sure I can do much better than that, other than saying, "Good question." It's really <laughs> hard to answer. Um, I think we can just do the best we can and find as much information as we can. Um, but I think one of the issues of museums and source communities uh, is the fact that you know, once an object is displayed, it will always have to go through an editing eye. Um, so you could get as much information from as many different sources as possible, but at the end of the day, it will be down to that curator who is editing the label, who decides what information gets put out to the public. Um, so it's a really, really hard decision to make when trying to figure out who gets to be the expert and who gets to decide who gets to be the expert. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the for the challenging question, Ananya. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw back a question to you actually, um, because I haven't given you one yet. <laughs> Doing that, but um, so uh, Gregory obviously couldn't couldn't be here tonight. We were we were hoping he might be able to join us, um, but he raised a really interesting point to, uh, to me in, in in communications over email, um, and he had approached the British Museum to ask permission to use an image of an object from Papua New Guinea in their collections for a forthcoming academic publication that he was doing. Um, and he mentioned in this communication that he was from Papua New Guinea and he was working for the National Museum um, and the British Museum charged him £54 um, to reproduce the image in his work. And his point was, um, I suppose, that there might be in some cases and, and we've mentioned sort of long term loans and sort of, you know, these conciliatory sort of um, approaches from museums, there might be a difference, a kind of slippage between what the museum or the provenance research and, and, and sort of work with source communities can do with museum policies and national laws, which might be working in opposite direction. So I'm wondering um, if you have any thoughts, because there's so much interesting kind of work going on around sort of repatriation of data as well, and the sense that what we own when we own an object isn't just the object, it's all of that, as as, as you were just saying, Sophie, as well. It's, it's how the label is written, how it's represented, um, how it's catalogued, all the rest. So it comes as a package, right? Um, and I think it's quite important to, to recognise that. So there isn't really a question there, but if you want to. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think uh, when you say that, it instantly makes me think of my first time at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. I was maybe 15 or 16 and I was like really wowed by the collection they had on India. Like it was quite interesting. It was displayed very nicely, which is not very often done in public museums in India. And because I'm I'm from India and there were specific um, things which I'd studied about there, I almost felt like, yes, I know about this object or I felt like a connection to that object. But then obviously it doesn't, um, while I'm connected to it like ethnically or in, in its origin, the object doesn't like, it belongs to an institution. There, there is like a gap or a disconnect. And I think recently, I don't know if any of you have read about it, this has happened before also, but I think at the end of September, there was a Congolese activist and four others who went on trial after they tried to remove a African funeral from a Paris museum, which I think was quite interesting. And um, I'm taking a module on African modernism this semester. So it makes me think of incidents like that, because when we think of ownership and um, like objects um, from other communities, which museums own, like who, who do they actually belong to? Who has the right to keep them? And I guess, again, like for reproducing an image, it may, it, it may on one end come across extremely unfairly to have to charge that much to reproduce an image for the purpose of research. But I guess, like you said, there's, there's a lot of changes that museums and institutions are trying to bring about to see what's right, to see what uh, we can do with in terms of procedure like for instance even loaning out an object to another museum it requires you to insure the object obviously but in some cases you may not have the funds to be able to insure the object but it belongs to a, the community you're from so I guess those are difficult questions to answer um, they, they do like there is a bit of a gray area like how do you loan out an object when you don't have the funds to cover the insurance and again, like not not an answer, but um, maybe Rowan and Sophie have 
something to add to this. Well, I, I, mean, I have another question for Rowan, so maybe if you if you have thoughts um, on that at the same time, you can you can jump in on both. Um, I wanted also just to, to, to roll back to that point you were making about um, the past being dynamic, but also the past coexisting with, with the present in a sense, and, and the sense of trying to link up past and present through objects, because what Ananya is describing there is, is an, a kind of in, an encounter with objects in the museum, which which does that, right? It's it's a dynamic encounter between museum visitors and, and, and objects. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to how that how that's happened successfully in your views in, in any exhibitions or, or any kind of interpretation that you can think of that has drawn on kind of contemporary moments or issues in order to sort of bring you know bring bring those two temporal moments back together, which I think was such an interesting point that you mentioned. Yeah, it is um, it is a tricky one, I think. Um, often museums are inherently uh, nervous about engaging, I think, in politics or I'd say critical or, you know, hot button issues, right? They're quite nervous about that. One story that comes to mind from about three years ago, I was visiting a friend in Boston and I went to their Museum of Fine Art. I went to the Oceanian Galleries and um, I was having a great time and then I noticed that they had gone for an interesting an interesting addition in that they included Indonesia in Oceania in their map and were quite inclusive around that and typically that's not done it's quite um, most scholars are quite sensitive and would say that Indonesia is considered its own section or might be included with Southeast Asia etc and and in general, I don't think, you know, lines on a map, what do they mean to the people in those communities? Sometimes they mean nothing, sometimes they mean everything. And in particular, I found it problematic because they had deliberately included um, West Papua, which is an, a nation uh, fighting for its own independence. It's politically held and is being, um, well, held against its will, really, and, and ex extorted and exploited for its natural resources, its copper and, and several other mining ventures. Uh, to get to my point is that there is really grievous human rights being violated and perpetuated by the Indonesian government. And I found it alarming that it, it was being put forward as sort of this unified Oceania and that that wasn't being considered. And it's it's not some small thing either. I mean, this has been an ongoing issue for the last 30 years. It's been brought to the UN, etc. So I contacted the curator for that gallery and I was speaking with her and as it happened, she was an African specialist in Benin um, sculpture, actually lovely, but she didn't know much about Oceania. And in the realities of the museum world, oftentimes colleagues will be given responsibility for things they're not experts in. They'll do the best they can, but they, you know, they don't have, they themselves don't have a lot of resources or knowledge in an area. So I explained the situation to her. I sent literature to her. I said, this really isn't appropriate. You need to change the signage. And she said, okay, I'm going to take it to the board. And I said, well, and if the board's at all naughty with you, tell them, I'm prepared to, to write an article about this, a very public article. And um, sure enough, amazingly, in the museum world, this was incredibly fast. In four weeks, she was able to get the funding, support and staff she needed to recreate that gallery and to give the Indonesian collections their own space in a separate gallery. So I, I really liked seeing that, but I encouraged at the same time, I said, why don't why don't you dedicate maybe like a film series to some of the things that are going on in that part of the world to what you know West Papuans are dealing with um, create you know some additional educational resources etc and there was not any appetite for that and there was indeed a fear that there would be a perception that they'd gotten it wrong etc but I was pleased to see that at least that was my voice could make a change for that I really I think that kind of representation is critical and oftentimes you know, we, we get it wrong in the museum community, not because we mean to, but because there just simply isn't the knowledge there. And so for me, I think that's an example of sort of an inadvertent form of like structural racism in the sense that there's just not the same knowledge and material, you know, support given to those collections that there really should have been. Um, so I'll stop with that story. I have others, but <laughs> I'll leave that one there.
Thank you so much. Um, and it's going back a bit to what Ananya said about you know, this constant need for, for re-evaluation really um, and, this, and the sense that it's yes it's okay to make mistakes but you've got to be prepared to kind of like build on those mistakes and um, and, and sort of rectify them and, and, and continue your, your work in that sense. Um, just to anyone listening if you do have any questions we're going into our final five minutes now so do post any questions that you might have. Um, Sophie, I wondered if I could if I could ask you a bit about um, the mouth ornament, and you know, obviously the museum is is still closed for now. But if that's going to go on display, and if so, if you could tell us a little bit about how um, it, how it will be displayed, if you know, and and, and what it will be displayed alongside, um, any sort of sneak previews. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the mouth ornament will be going on display. Um, it's going to be going into Gallery 4, which is going to be called Encountering Cultures. Um, also to any of my colleagues who are watching this, uh, this hasn't been agreed on how much I'm allowed to reveal, so I am going off the cuff. Um, but yes, it's going to be displayed in Gallery 4, which is um, entitled Encountering Cultures, um, and it's going to be discussing about the university's links to the wider world. Um, we have so many links, uh, historic and new, um, it talks about, you know, we've got Everest expeditions and we've got telescopes, mariners, astrolabes. It's, it's a really, really good gallery. Um, but in it, we do discuss about how we don't necessarily have amazing information about all the objects in there um, and about the fact that uh, some of the objects we do believe might have been collected in less than fortunate circumstances where power imbalances had a role to play. Um, we try, we try to address it as best we can, but I do believe there is a label going in saying, you know, if you have information about our objects um, that you believe will help improve our knowledge, please get in contact with us. Because like this critical conversation suggests, you know, uh, we don't have all the knowledge. Uh, and I think going back to what Rowan said, you know, we have this amazing collection, but it's so diverse and it's so varied. You can't be an expert in all of it. You know, we've got our ethnographic collection, but we have historic scientific instruments, we have skeletons, we have got geology collections, we have got silver, like you, you cannot be an expert on all of it. Um, so yeah, so Encountering Cultures is going to kind of address some of these issues that we do face with our collection. Um, but I, th I think people will enjoy the displays, they, they do look amazing. Um, and it, I think if anyone went to the museum before, I personally never got to go to the museum before it was redisplayed, but I've been told on good authority that it, it really does, it has been improved and it looks really great. Um, and yeah, you'll be able to find this alongside many different cultures. Um, it, it's not, for better or for worse, we don't have, you know, enough stuff from Papua New Guinea to have a whole place dedicated to that region. Um, I think that is another issue in museums is you only get so many words to capture someone and to convey this information. So there's a lot of complexities that will just be completely missed. You know, the geopolitical complexities Rowan was talking about, it won't be mentioned because you don't have the words, unfortunately. Um, you have these, you know, 40 character word limits uh, that you have to stick to. Um, but I, be I believe it is, it is a very good museum, so please do come along when we do finally open. <laughs> Just doing a little plug for the Wardlow Museum, please come. Um, it looks incredible. Uh, the mouth ornament looks great, but there are some other amazing, amazing objects that are going in. Uh, some are directly related to research that's happening now, some of it's historic research. Uh, and I think you'll be intrigued to see the stories that you wouldn't expect to be related to our museum. Uh, and our university coming out. Great, thank you, Sophie, and thank you for the for the plug for the ward law as well. <laughs> and it's open. Um, I think you're absolutely right in so much that you say, and it's it's to me it's even a little bit of a shame that we can't tell that whole story about the provenance research um, and have that really kind of evidenced in, in in the exhibition. But I I think it's quite a wealth actually that it's part of. A global collection that also reflects all of those different dynamics um, that St Andrews has enjoyed over the past and continues today as, as I think has been mentioned. Um, our student body is such a huge resource for us when we're thinking about how to manage these collections um, and it's great uh, that we can involve um, students in that conversation as well. 
I will wrap things up now um, and just say a huge, huge thank you to all of our panelists tonight um, and to you all for, for coming. Um, and uh, I think this will be available on the museum's uh, YouTube uh, channel as well for, for anyone who wants to catch up later. So thank you very much and good night.